going awesome. Well, we, we do have lots to praise God for. He has, uh, he has promised us tremendous blessings. We'll bless the Lord at all times, right? We're just singing that. And uh, we're talking a lot about blessing here today. Uh, the, the blessings uh, that God has showered upon us and He has promised to us as well. And um, as we've been going through the, the, the book of Galatians, it's been kind of a fascinating process because you can tell, uh, if, you, and if you haven't been with us along, along the route, it really does feel like every single week, Paul is just on this kind of rant against the things that are happening in these Galatian churches. And, uh, and really, very simply, to summarize it, uh, Paul helped to start these churches. Uh, they were going really well. And then somehow, some way, these people came in to, to tell them, oh, by the way, you still have to follow all of these old Jewish laws and regulations. And they kind of took their word on it and started doing this. And Paul is incensed that they have given up the blessing that God had given to them in, in favor of all of these laws. You can kind of see that. In, uh, in this next slide. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and weary? Go back to slavery? You willingly go back to these, these weak and, and elementary principles, these worthless things? Why would you do that? You can kind of see him multiple times along the way in Galatians, you can kind of feel him going, ah, why would you do this? I don't get it. And there's an interesting phrase along the way uh, that we see Paul say, what then has become of your blessedness? And that really struck me when I was reading, what then has become of your blessedness? And that word blessed, we see a lot throughout the Bible. We see Jesus use the word blessed. A lot. We heard it in our gospel lesson for today. But what, what I really saw there was a connection between Abraham and the blessing. Along the way, Paul has been using Abraham as the example of faith. Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. The faith of Abraham looks a lot like the faith that we are to have. A faith in a promised blessing. And so that got me thinking, maybe this blessedness, maybe there's something to this blessedness. And so we take a look at the promised blessings that were to Abraham. Maybe we can see some of the blessing that uh, Paul is concerned that they're missing. Well, the words to Abraham were simple, right? Just leave your land and go to the place I show you. Yeah, simple, right? Leave the place where you are. Now, already, Abraham has traveled with his father to Haran, which is kind of at the top there. And then, now, God says, you've got to finish this journey. You've got to come back down into this land that I will show you. And it's called the Promised Land. It's the land that has been promised to Abraham and to his descendants. Because the next one is all about God saying, I will make you into a great nation. Which means he's going to have... Children. He's going to have a boy. Okay, we all, I mean, those of us who know the story obviously know that was, that was somewhat of a challenge as well along the way. Um, but, but Abraham's going to become this great nation. And then the last part of this, I just love this. He says, I'm going to bless you and make your name great. I'm, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And look at all that blessing going on. There's blessing going every which way here. But this is the promise. There is a promised blessing that is given to Abraham. Now, this is no small thing that God is asking of Abraham. For instance, leave, you leave your land. Well, for Abraham to leave his land means that he's going to have to leave everything behind in order to follow God. The people of that day were very closely tied to the land. The land was a part of their identity. It's part of who they are. Then God tells them, you're going to be a great nation. Well, that also means he's going to be disconnected from his family. 
Because for them, genealogies, lineages are very important. But for him to become a great nation means he's going to turn away from his father and the lineage that came before him, and a new nation starts with him. So he's further disconnected. He's leaving the old behind, and something new is coming, something brand new and awesome is coming through this blessing. And then, of course, this whole business about being blessed to be a blessing means that Abraham needs to be willing to become a conduit for the blessing of God. We talked about that in our children's message. The only way any of these things are going to be able to happen is by faith. It's the only way. Now, I have a picture up here that's very similar to what we had in our children's message. And I just put it up here to remind you of what a conduit is. A conduit is a tube. A conduit is some sort of a means by which something can get from one place to another. The conduit itself is not the important part. However, it is necessary. The important part is whatever, whatever's traveling through that conduit, be it electrical wires or um, you know, some sort of gas or water or whatever, traveling from one place to another. The important thing is that whatever it is gets from point A to successfully to point B. Abraham was called by God to be a conduit for the blessings of God. And you can see that here. I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And you can kind of draw it somewhat like this. So you have God at the top, and then he's going to bless Abraham. And so Abraham then is going to be a blessing to everyone else. And so Abraham becomes the conduit, the means by which the blessing is going to flow out to the people. And really, all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth, are going to be blessed through Abraham. And so you can see that in this passage that shows up here. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. The next thing that is said, though, is really interesting, too. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. Well, this makes sense, too, if you think about it in the conduit kind of language. It makes sense. If you're, if you're trusting that the, the, the conduit, if you're, if you're blessing the conduit in a sense, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get you from one, one point to another, right? However, what happens if you, if you take a good gash into that, into that conduit? Let's just say it's holding gas or, or water. That water's not going to get there, right? You're, you're, there's, a, there's a curse in the midst of that. There's, you're not going to get the blessing if, if you attack the conduit. Same thing here. He who blesses you will be blessed. If they curse you, they'll be cursed. Because Abraham's the conduit. Abraham is the way in which the blessing of God is going to get out to all of these other people. Well, I can't help but to hear some other things ringing in my ears when I hear these passages of Scripture. I actually hear Jesus. Matthew 10. Whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. Sounds awfully similar, doesn't it? Whoever receives you, receives me. You're the conduit. We're the conduits. Because if somebody receives us, they're going to get Jesus. And then we get this also in this passage here from Matthew 18. Whoever receives one such child in my name, receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. So this one also includes that kind of cursing language too. All right? So if you're going to receive one of these children of mine, you're going to receive that blessing. You're going to receive Jesus. But if you're going to cause one of them to sin, you're going to cut off that blessing. It would be better for you to drown in the depths of the sea than to have that happen. And so when we go back to this image that we have, we can kind of see how Jesus lays on top of all of that the cross and the kingdom. In the cross of Jesus Christ, we have the ultimate blessing. It doesn't get better than having God himself 
come and redeem this world of all of the gross, ugly sin that happens all around us. You know about it. You live with it. You interact with it. And there's just enough of it going on in your own life to know how terrible it is and what it can be. This is what Jesus has come to save us from. This is the ultimate blessing that has come into our lives. And we are the kingdom of God. We are the ones who have received that blessing by grace. Just like Abraham. What did Abraham do to deserve God coming and saying, I'm going to bless you? It just happened. <laughs> right? And that's kind of the way it is for us, right? God just comes into our lives and he says, here, here's the best, most amazing gift you've ever been given. Be blessed to be a blessing. And whereas we see, you know, Abraham's name becoming great, now it's the name of Jesus that is great. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So the name of Abraham, and by the way, it's not your name that gets to be great. It's not my name that gets to be great. It's Jesus' name who gets to be great. Any of us who wants our names to be great, we got other problems. But it's Jesus' name who is great. And we are the ones who are a conduit for that greatness, for that beauty, for that joy, for that, that grace to come into the lives of other people. And so it makes a lot of sense then when we get to like a Matthew chapter 5, where we see all of these beatitudes. And if we had another whole hour, I'd be more than happy to take us through every one of these and, and have a life-changing experience. I don't see any takers on that, so we're going to keep going. But, but this is an, these are the blessings of God. Blessed are you when you're poor in spirit. Blessed are you when, when, you, when you mourn and you see the, 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 the brokenness of our world. You know, and it goes on and on until, <laughs> blessed are you when you actually make a difference in this world and you're merciful. Blessed are you when you actually get into the midst of the brokenness of the world and you make peace, real peace. Blessed are you when, when people, you're making such a difference in the world that people come after you who you don't even know. What a blessing. If we're so effective in being a conduit for the blessings of God to go into the rest of the world, these are the kinds of things we're going to see. And Jesus says that the blessing just grows and grows, become a greater conduit. More and more blessing can flow through us as we deepen our discipleship, as we deepen what it means to, to follow Jesus and a total adherence to who he is and what he's done and what he can do through us. So you can see why Paul gets so upset. What then has become of your blessedness? The, the blessedness that started with Abraham. The blessedness that's come through Jesus. The blessedness for Paul that actually was extended to him. This isn't just Paul who's who, who hears about a church out there somewhere and says, hmm, sounds like they're doing a bunch of good things. I'm really sad that they're not doing that anymore. Paul experienced the blessedness himself. It's right in our reading. You know it was because of a body of bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. So when Paul came to the Galatians, he had problems. We don't know what those problems were. But he had problems enough that he required the care of the people he was preaching to. So as he's preaching the blessed life of discipleship, is preaching the cross of Christ, redeeming them from their sins, he's hurting. And what happens except that the blessing that was coming to the Galatians came right back to him. And they cared for him. And they loved him. They passionately loved him. To the point where he says this. For I testify to you that if possible you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. We don't usually use that kind of language for people's love for us. But it's pretty profound. That's the way he was being blessed. The Galatian people got it. They understood it. 
It was right here in their hearts. And when they saw someone hurting, they poured out their lives into that person. It just so happens that that person was Paul. And so you can, see, you can see how to challenge it is for Paul to look at this beautiful picture of how God has given us Jesus Christ, how he's given it to his kingdom. His kingdom can be a conduit for blessing. And then it gets cut off. Because they go astray. They go towards something else. They're like, well, you know, we got these laws and they make me feel good because I feel like I have more control over my life and... And, you know, really I should be able to control my own destiny instead of having someone else control it. So why don't I just go this way? You know what that reminds me of? There's this, there's this awesome geological kind of feature called an oxbow lake. It actually starts with a river. A river that looks kind of like this. And the river's flowing along. And, when, and as you're thinking of this as an analogy, think of the riverbed as a conduit and the river itself as the blessing. Okay? So the river, the river is the means by which God's, God's blessing is flowing. So here, here we're going along, and, and we're the river, man. I mean, we're, the, we're this conduit whereby God's, God's grace can be flowing back to other people. And now I have to go back. Okay. So we, we get diverted. We get diverted by something, anything, whatever it might be. My own thoughts, my own desires, a law that comes in, whatever other gospel you can come up with, right? But you're getting, you're getting off to the side. Well, look what happens slowly. Oh, wow, I'm having problems. Um, slowly, what happens, the natural erosion of the river starts to close that gap until finally you have this area of water that's been cut off from the stream. And, that, and the flow continues, but not through the lake. Now it's become a lake, and there is no running water in that lake anymore. In fact, you've already seen it now that I've I had problems with my slides. But you can see what an oxbow lake looks like once it's been cut off. This is what Paul is afraid of. You've diverted. You've gone somewhere else. The blessings, you think you can just go way over here and come back, and then the blessings of God are going to flow. I'm sorry. The blessings of God have to flow through you. And if you want to take a diversion, you run the risk of becoming a mosquito-infested, moss-filled lake that has absolutely no running water. And is no blessing to anyone. What then has become of your blessings? This is the fear. Honestly, this is my fear. This is my fear for, for every Christian. It's my fear for our church. It's the fear, my fear for the, for the entire American Christian church. I, I fear we get, I get, we get sidetracked. <coughs> And our blessing gets sidetracked. And there's a fear we're going to get cut off. The blessing of God must flow through us. We are the conduit for God's grace in this world. That we can show mercy upon people. That we can love them unconditionally. That we can take the cross of Christ that has made us a free person and give that freedom to the people around us. It takes many forms, but we have opportunities every day to bless people. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us be blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Amen.